Good afternoon. Thank you for spending time with you, us and for the next uh, 50 minutes or an hour. Uh, this work is uh, mainly done at Duke University by a team of uh, our group, and especially the slides is uh, uh, worked together with uh, Dr. Wu, and uh, she's uh, sitting there, and she said, why don't you just finish it? I don't have to touch it too much. So my presentation will be kind of complementary to what uh, uh, Jim has uh, discussed about that, and I will be uh, more focused on the implementations of using varying technologies, and because that's the, all we have. Now, if I want to disclose you that this uh, Duke University does have a research uh, agreement with uh, varying and uh, some projects, but not specifically for this project. Uh, my presentation will be a uh, focus on the following six uh, uh, aspects. The first, I'm going to discuss the fundamentals uh, for the rapid arc. So everybody uh, probably knows uh, more than I do is uh, VMAT, Intensive Moderate Arc Therapy, Volumetric, uh, the VMAT. Uh, this is an arc-based approach to do the MRT, and that's a uh, discussable uh, whether this is a part of the format of MRT, but we consider this is a, a part of the supplemental to the MRT technologies. And it to be uh, delivered on a conventional linear accelerator and uh, with a conventional MLC. What's the difference is that during an arc, the leaves of the MLC moves and the dose rate changes continuously as the gantry rotates and with different speed. Now, rapid arc is part of the format of VMAT. I think both APM Astro agrees that we're not going to use rapid arc as a scientific name. VMAT will be used as uh, moderate the rotational arc therapies. So later on, I will be uh, more focused on using the name of VMAT. And this is a slide just to try to show the difference between the con conformal beam and MRT difference because MRT to intensity moderations provide advantage that allow you to spare the critical organs like spinal cord when you do the MRT beam compared to the conventional beam. So what's the difference between the VMAT? Uh, very simply, and the VMAT does not provide the beam and I think I want to show this slide. What MRT typically do is at each gantry angle, you have a multiple segments put together. So when you have a dynamic MLC, leaf changing the shape continuously. And you can have stepping shoe technique and leaf overlay together. And then you change your angle and then you have another stack of intensity module. Now the difference between VMAT is at each angle, they only have one shape but they have a multiple angles, so all come put together and, you know, to achieve the goal like you achieved there. So sometimes the, uh, Jim was asking question whether VMAT is fast or not, because currently when we do MRT with bearing technology, we have the mold up of field, finish delivery, and then we have uh, change the gantry there and the mold out again, and that take a time. However, if you don't have to mold up again, and this time may be reduced. So the time-wise has to be really uh, look at uh, as a whole as uh, the integrations. And this is the uh, the field that you typically use for prostate with the uh, arc therapy and the VMAT. And this is typically MRT. And the way usually, if you're using one arc. You rotate from 179 to 180 to avoid some software bug 180. They don't know which direction to go. So that's the reason we do that. And MRT typically you start in 180 and then you have equally distributed or some uh, uh, peripheral angle and uh, with a seven to five to nine angles you use for this. So here's the current status, the, what options are uh, uh, available. The treatment planning systems, Eclipse, which is a varying technology and which we most are familiar with at the Duke, 
and there's a, a monocle uh, from Lactor, and they are continuously modifying and uh, to integrating with uh, other uh, C- CMS systems. And uh, the pinnacle with a smart arc uh, uh, marked by Philips, and there's a prowess by marked by prowess system. And if you look at the exhibition hall, and the Brain Lab is uh, starting to market the uh, hyper arc technology, which is combined arc and with the uh, MRT static beam. So it could be a part of it, but you know you have to judge yourself. Um, existing delivery systems and uh, rapid arc from the variant and the nose called VMAT, the same as uh, the lactose VMAT. And then uh, the work in progress in the Siemens is we have a cone beam therapy technology, which is a, uh, will be uh, available. Existing QA systems, uh, there's many QA systems available. In the early days, most people using the 2D technologies and uh, with uh, multiple planes and the films, the matrix, and the uh, map check, and uh, with uh, some nuclear and uh, some nuclear node develop the 3D system with uh, arc check as well data for technologies and uh, which we are uh, looking into uh, for the future uh, applications. So where we are, what Duke is doing, which may be uh, just to give you some examples or reference and the way, whether you judge whether this is the proper way to do it, but this is the way how we do that. And we start to investigate this technology in June 2008. That's three years ago. And uh, we kind of have a research planning stations from the variant before we really have a system to do that and we get to, to understand whether this uh, provide any dosimetry advantages. And we clinically installed this system uh, uh, in October. We did accepting tests, commissionings, and the QAs for about a couple months. And then we look at the uh, planning technologies with a single arc, no cultural rotations, and the partial arcs. That's how the publication come from, because we did a comparison with all these uh, different technologies and uh, compare with the MRT and the conformal beams. And we treat the first patient this December 2008, so it's about the six months as a grace period for us to learn what this technology is and also as a part of the training to our staff to how to use that, this technology, where this can be used, and uh, how to be safely and uh, has uh, improved the quality uh, in the applications. So currently, there's a new version. You know, we got from a uh, couple upgrades in uh, August 2009, and the late. Later, we got the upgrade in the 2011s, and this will allow us to perform the multiple arcs, and people do feel like a single arc is not perfect yet, and then multiple arc is required, and it's required the coach rotations, especially for the uh, brain uh, treatment. When we treat the five mass in the brain with a single isocentum, five arc, so we have to do the coach rotations. And the partial blocking, like if you do the partial breast and the partial uh, liver treatment. Next, I'm going to uh, briefly touch the infrastructure installations uh, because this is actually simple, but it's very practical to every institution because this is what you have to face immediately, whether you can do it, what you needed to do there. And the first thing you need a good staff. And at foremost is you have a really a dedicated physicist and they are very well trained and in this specific technologies, not just the board certified, but specific trained with the VMAT technologies. Uh, the staff, including the physician, need to know whether VMAT technology will provide the better dosimetry information, and also the therapists need to understand how this uh, uh, technology can be properly delivered and what is the potential risk or safety involved when they uh, handle patient in the treatment room. And existing machine, and we install this technology in the 21EX machines, which has uh, 120 le- uh, leaves, millennium MLC, which was a uh, leaf width was uh, five millimeter. And in addition to that, we 
implement this technology into Navarro's TX machine, which is basically a trilogy plus brain lab SRS systems. But in addition to that, there's a high definition MLC with 2.5 millimeter. Um, this machine mainly we use it to do the radio surgery as well as SBRTs. And it will require the software uh, version is 8.6 or above. Currently, we're running version 10. Uh, Eclipse, uh, uh, Eclipse planning system, uh, that including both hardware and the software upgrade, and definitely this is the version will take in you into the uh, uh, applications for this uh, VMAT. And then the QA is another big thing, which is continuously involving the technologies. Accepting tests and the commissionings. Um, this is actually a very interesting topic. And when we do this, the, uh, the, our test group report T from TTAG has not been even initiated at that time. And uh, so some of the work we did is uh, complementary to what uh, uh, the report required. And uh, some report required actually has not been fully implemented into the, uh, our current commissioning. So, such as the two slide te test uh, Jim uh, showed before with the, those uh, uniformities. And uh, what the important things, as Jim mentioned, that, that this accepting test is very important in the commissionings and you do with the vendors because most leaf shapes to test MLC, you have to get from the vendors. And I don't know whether any vendor is here, elector or the varying and the engineer here. Do we have any varying or elected people here? No? Okay. I, okay. <laughs> Good, thanks. Uh, it's very important that I think you, when you go back, you're going to ask them that we need this leaf shape for, to do this test. And some leaf test is not easy to be done by yourself. So I think that's the one first thing we need to do. And the machine readiness. First, you have to uh, verify the installation against the items included in the uh, purchase order. Now, I, I put here absent test commission because really you're very difficult to find where is exact accepting test defined and what is the commission was defined, what is the differences. Now, we know very well for the commissioning of machine treated planning system commission, but for different stuff, it's quite different. So this is what we think, the machine readiness, and you need to verify all this, and you need to in, uh, do some kind of inspections of the safety and the quality of the installations. Make sure they run so smooth and meet the uh, spec you did. And the VMAT performance, and there's a number of tests related to the functionality of each component. That was the two-stage test what Jim was talking about. And the system as a whole, the performance against the specifications. And then we do the end to end test. And certainly you have to draw a few test cases uh, from the simulations to deliveries. That was. So this is some of the uh, sample tests which you, we are looking at. And this is a very basic, so you test the gantry angle calibration. So make sure at the different gantry angle, the output is the same, which is everybody do it for the annual check. And the gantry rotation calibration is to get a 0.5 degree spec. You know, with a true beam, this probably can be uh, come down to the even a uh, better accuracies. And they will test the 1.2, the isocenter calibrations, and that's, that's typically we limited with uh, plus or uh, minus uh, one millimeters. And the general octal symmetry. So the test are basically two parts. One is the geometric accuracy. The second part is the dosimetric accuracies. And this is a more geomet geometric and the point 1.1 and 1.2, and the three is to start to look at the dosimetries, and then you give the range per degree with the different MUs, and the 0.2 and the 5.0 MU per degree, and then you look at the tolerance should be within 1%. Because the dose rate changes when you rotate the gantry angles, and this test is very important for you to uh, perform that. And you probably will see this is a kind of Okay, uh, the leaf is, isn't moving. And then we will look at the, uh, those symmetric tests, the D, uh, D, 
MLC uh, dosimetries. So what do you do is you have a, this is a, a MLC designed or the provided by the vendor and they have a 0.5 mili, uh, 0.5 uh, uh, cm MLC slit. Basically five millis, um, is sliding over the four cm ranges. And uh, you look at the gantry at the zero and then you take another image at the gantry 90 degree and then 270 and then 180. And you make sure the output any point you're looking at is within plus minus 2%. That's over all the mean values. Okay, th- this is the DMLC, the test that you, you subtract. And then you look at the accuracy of DMLC position versus the gantry angle. That's the positioning test. And that way, w- do the same things, and uh, you can see, and uh, we want to make sure and the tolerance is uh, within uh, uh, one millimeters plus minus. And this is another test that to look at the accuracy DMLC position during the arc. When this is rotate and the slit is moving, and we want to make sure the position of the uh, MLC is uh, plus or minus uh, one millimeter. And this is uh, shows the how you get the uh, uh, fan, uh, pick the fence uh, diagrams when you have a gantry zero degree, 90 degree, 180 degree, 270 degrees. Now, when we do that, we have to take all this, the film and the portal dosimeter, we have to take the data out to analyze all this information. But right now, a lot of uh, software is available building the systems so you can do it uh, uh, a little bit more efficiently. And this is how the, we did all the data and then you, you plot the profile and then look at all the Values and the positions, the peak positions, and to get the average readings, and to see, make sure this is all within one uh, two mil, uh, uh, millimeters here, point two millimeters, uh, two millimeters here. And next, you will be uh, testing the accuracy, the MLC position. You know how the MLC will be able to detect errors. So when you Design a MLC shape on purposely have a 0.5 millimeter uh, deviations, and then you have to see whether you the pick fan uh, images will be able to detect uh, this uh, kind of deviations, and that's kind of look at. I'm sure everybody do the similar types, but for this VMAT, you probably have to look at the different angles uh, with uh, with the certain uh, gantry rotation angle rotations. And that is because of the shape was designed by the vendor, and then they can uh, put it with a different gantry speed at the one shape, and then the other one is with a different gantry. So you can test multiple uh, parameters at the one uh, rungs. And this is to te- test the dosimetry accuracies and the, the accuracy of the dose rate and the gan- versus the gantry speed and the, during the rapid arc. And basically what it, what it do is that when gantry rotates and the, the, sli- uh, the, the slit is moving around with that and with a different speed and the, this is controlled by the, you know, the prescriber of the, each field. So that's why the vendor needed to do a, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, all these uh, files for us in, uh, because the users would be very difficult to do program all this stuff. And the other thing uh, we have to see, we should be able to uh, control the uh, leaf speed and the position during the rapid arc. So this is basically you want to make sure the leaf speed and the position is all right when gantry angle is uh, changes. And the this tolerance is uh, the Look at the dosimetries is a, basically is a point, uh, is a plus a two, per, minus a two percent. And the basically we, what we did is the plot of the, what the slit and it was the kind of the pick fence, the uh, images, and we look at the, the peak values and to make sure and all this is the, the gantry versus the dose rate with the tolerance uh, within uh, two millimeters. And with the off axis and the axis values and the, which is plotted at the three different. And this is the results we got and uh, all this, uh, you can uh, see that. So commissioning. Commissioning is a, is a virtually we look at the three things to validate that the VMAT is capable of delivering uh, radiation beam as good as uh, 
standard, uh, static gantry MRT could. So basically, commissioning will not only just put the data in, but also look at the, the, the comparisons between the VMAT and the, sta- uh, the conventional MRTs. The second component we're looking at is to define the limitation of planning optimizations, gantry rotations, beam blocking, coach rotation, and uh, leaf speed. So we consider the commissioning is the follow-up work after you accept the machine. You accept the machine that the machine can function properly. But commissioning basically is how to make this ma- machine which can be applied to patient cares. So this is what we're looking at and this are uh, the numbers. Okay. And also commissioning we consider should include to develop a treatment process as well as how to document the treatment process. And we consider this a part of the uh, commissionings. So basically with this, and uh, we uh, have a sheet and then compare the, for this, we actually do a site-specific comparisons between the VMAT and the conventional MRTs. And uh, this is the, typically the workflows. And you select the case, and basically looks very similar to what the conventional beam, uh, the MRT is because we consider case selection is important. Now, in order to provide which case is feasible, is not feasible, and then we did a thorough uh, planning test, and we did a look at the head, neck, brain, uh, lung, liver, spine, breast, and the different prost- prostate and the pelvic sides. So we did all the comparisons. Certainly the, for the lung and the liver, we have to do very, very carefully. And we really discourage people to use MRT or rapid arc for the liver and the lung if, you, if it's uh, for free breathing treatment, unless it's a gated or breast hole. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, how we do this kind of comparisons. Uh, th- this is just uh, shows the treatment processes. So traditionally, the MRT, you, the, this is the traditional technique. Okay, you put a number of beams for the spine radio surgery. We put uh, like a, between nine to eleven beams posteriorly, and what the computer come out is intensity map, and then you do leaf segmentation, get the standard. Uh, now, there's a new technology. Uh, other people it, uh, investigating is a directory of op- optimizations. So you can go straight from here to there. But traditionally, this is the most uh, uh, treatment planning system implement. The rapid arc, this one is uh, totally removed. They go straight aperture based optimization technique. And the planning, the, uh, the preparations. So we consider rapid arc application should be site specific. You do not using RepDoc for any sites, and you have to test it. For each site, what we did, we select the 10 cases. So previously, we did MRTs. And then we developed RepDoc plans with different options. Single arc, two arcs, partial arcs, blocked arcs. And then compare between MRT with RepDoc relative to the those two, DVH, dose distributions, and a certain volume and the dose at the specific locations. We look at the MU comparisons. We look at the delivery times and all this. And then we look at the constraints and the optimizations. And we compare the op- op- optimization algorithms and how this is implemented in the each treatment planning system and how is the sensitivity or the constraints in the each algorithm because uh, each company will have uh, different algorithms and each algorithm have a different ways to how to control the constraints of the different structures. And this is, is a very important because you never know, even the writing say what technique is each, the technique, how this is uh, physically will run. So unless you run it, you did the, the plan, then you will notice that how the sensitive this constraint is and when to do the constraint adjustment. The strategy is the first that you select the site-specific plan, planning. And for, for example, what our experience is, and most of the paper, all this comparison was published in the red journals. We have three or four papers published on this. For the plus, the only we can do the one arc. 
the plaster bed, most time you can get into the one arc. You know, sometimes it's really complicated, you may need the two arcs. For prostate, the plaster uh, uh, semivascular structures, and you're using what can you use in what. And for most of brain tumors, single brain tumors, you can use in the single arcs. Now, two arcs. The prostate plus the semivascular plump lymph nodes. For those kind of sites, you definitely need more than one arc. Two arc is the minimum you need. The spinal cord, and you need the two arcs. The brain lesions. Now, brain lesion here is like you, you have a multiple lesions. If you treat it, sometimes you need the two arcs or the different table kick even. And we did a number of uh, uh, brain lesions with uh, multiple arcs, as I mentioned here. When you treat uh, five meds, and if you do single isolate one after another, take a long time. But with the rapid arc, you do single isocenter and five arcs, and that achieved the goal very effectively, efficiently. So head and neck typically is two arcs, and but we, sometimes you can do three arcs, three partial arcs, but two arcs is typically what we do. And the rectal, anal rectal cancer, and typically we do some two arcs and sometimes more. Now we also do partial arcs, and those are actually very uniform region, like a partial breast uh, uh, treatment, uh, accelerate a partial the breast treatment, you know, typically you give a 10 fraction. And we did a comparison this, uh, we found a, a partial arc will achieve as good as what you can do. And there's some liver tumors and the lung tumor if you doing breath hold. And optimizations. The key challenges, uh, there's uh, interconnectivity of the beam shape uh, with a conceptive uh, uh, VMAT gantry position, and that is the major change. So the constraints, you have to do target the normal structure simultaneously and uh, to look into, and uh, some mechanical constraints also have to be considered. And the optimization algorithms, you know, you need to have a good understanding. So what the parameters you should use and app, because it's actual based objectives and the algorithms. And also the MLC segments limitations you need to know. And the number of segments typically in MRT we're looking at and the rapid arc is only single, uh, segments. The prim- quality is comparable if you're using the same segment. That's what we're talking about. Because when you look at uh, MRT plan is better than rapid arc plan, or rapid arc is better than arm plan, you have to really look at the number of segments. Rapid arc, single arc only have 177 segments, or the divided by two, that's even less. And uh, the usually MRT for head and neck, you have much more than 170 uh, uh, that's kind of segments. So that's why MRT is big. If you do two arcs, and then when the number of segments are getting close, the implant quality may be uh, very close. And uh, Jackie has a paper in the PMB published the analysis of the relationship between the, seg- uh, the number of segments and the MUs related to between MRT and the rapid arc. Um, typically, you know, you get the more segments, the gantry have to Rotate the slower and uh, for the rapid arc. And uh, the more segments, you will probably get uh, more treatment time. So the planner experience is uh, quite uh, uh, important. And uh, you can have uh, the same uh, plan but can have uh, quite a different results if uh, one has a very skilled, one is less skilled. So I think uh, the experience is uh, very important. You need uh, to understand the well with the algorithm as well as the limitations and what you can do and what you cannot do. Logistics. Uh, we typically, if you do the trainings, you know, multiple people should be involved in the planning and then so everybody knows what's going on and what is the limitations passed around and gain the experience and the developing uh, planning protocols. For each site, we have kind of protocol, say this is using two arc and the shape of angle with this, and you, that's the starting point. And it typically take three months for us to get the patient uh, really started. And uh, next, the uh, deliveries. The leaf limit is, that is the limit. 
and there's 2.5 cm per second. That's the minimum, uh, the maximum, uh, the minimum leaf motion limit. And then the five millimeter per degree, that's the faster they can go. And the dose rate and the, and the rotation speed and the diff, you know, different version may have a slightly different. So we have to know all this, the larger MUs, the smaller MU, the limit and the middle varying gantry speed because of the, Hardware, they may implement a delivery differently for different. So if you have a large MU, they were using the maximum dose rate and then vary the gantry speed. For smaller MU, they were using the maximum uh, gantry speed and the varying dose rate. That's the different machine, different vendor may implement differently. So this is something we need to aware. And this is one example. For example, the, this one, the dose rate was uh, uh, changing. But the gantry uh, speed is fixed. Okay, you can go to the MLC control file and to look at each beam how they deliver. When if the, this is fixed and this gantry speed will change, so this is typically that how it works in uh, this uh, uh, different unit, especially the the bearing machine. That's how it works, and the bearing. You, you know, you have variable gantry speed. You have a dose rate that changes. Now, you for the Novars, we have zero to one thousand. For Trubium, you have even more, and this is the changes. And we have to look into the what the QA need to be done with the higher MBUs and the sensitivities. The variable dose per degree, and you can starting from 0.2 MU to 20 MU per degrees, and the MLC speed can be from zero to two per five uh, cm per second. Delivery efficiencies. So we look at the plan quality first. The quality of plan is the number of apertures, the single arc typically, as I just mentioned, and the complexity of the structures. The more apertures per arc and the typically and the multiple arcs. So delivery time, the single arc typically take less time and but quality could, but sometimes the quality could be lower. So you have to use in multi arcs. Multi arcs Typically give you better qualities, but you know, take a relatively longer time because you will finish one arc and then go this way. If, if you're still starting from the same way, you have to rotate the back. But ideally you want to one clockwise, the other arc to go to counterclockwise. And the treatment time. The treatment time is actually had to be separated two parts. One is the patient setup time. The other is the delivery time. Even the delivery time, there's a, two, there's a number of components. One is the beam on time. The other is the between beam on time. Okay. So this is actually very, very critical because often we spend more time is the between beam on time. This is taking longer time than beam on times. So patient set of time, typically you cannot reduce it. Being on time, you can reduce 20 to 60 percent based on our experience, because it's the less I'm used. But between beam on time, 100 percent saving for single arc, 20 to 60 percent saving for multiple arcs. So the, the efficiency changes. And this is the example for the partial arc for the, the breast case. And if ISO center is close to the center, and this actually works pretty good, and you have a one arc, and then you block here, and then the arc, this is a single arc, but with the middle block for the partial breast. And the results was uh, quite impressive. And uh, this is a uh, result actually published in the Red Journal last year. And this is uh, a liver, two liver lesion. We do liver SBRT and we do the breath hold. And if you treat a sing, single one individually, it's, uh, it's not very efficient. And uh, the overlap those could be uh, quite uh, uh, substantial. So what we did is just uh, using a uh, partial arc. And uh, the rapid arc MU is uh, 7, 5, 14. And if you do IMRT, total MU is uh, this much. So you can reduce it uh, substantially. And the treat delivery time with this uh, should uh, go down to uh, only uh, two minutes or less. And this is the whole, uh, the five brain mass case. If you do single arc, it's pretty messy. But if you do multiple arcs, you separate the dosimetry individually. So for the multiple brain mass, we typically do five arcs, four to five arcs with a table uh, kick. 
and uh, you se- select one single isocenter, and the result is as good as what you do individual isocenter. The next is the, the other parameter we look at is a larger field, larger size. Now, typically, if you have a larger PTV, so ideally you want to open field really big. But is that necessary? And we look at this uh, issues and very carefully. So typically for the larger field, sometimes MRT beam has a triple uh, beam spread, okay, which will take you, if you have a triple one and the universe is nine beams and uh, it's a 21 field, the delivery will be taking you 20 to 30 minutes to finish it, okay. And also the multi-sections plus or the PTVs and the large variation of PTV shape OAR and their constraint. So the beam orientation selection is a part of our MRT prime is often not quite useful for rapid arc because in the, this is the full arc. But the difference is that you can use with, uh, with the two ways to look at. Now one is we can use in larger field and the other is using a relative uh, small field. So we look at the one is a 17 cm field size, which is uh, much less than the PTV in, uh, 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 in this uh, specific uh, directions. Three arcs and the 1,000. And then we also look at the MRT plans. And this one, you can see the results is uh, quite uh, comparable with the three uh, arcs with the 17 uh, cm's. And then you can look at the, the, the differences here, and this is the MRT, and this is the rapid arc results, and it's, a, you know, in general, that is a quite a comparable, uh, especially on this the small bowel uh, minimizations. And this is the, the different levels, those distributions. And then if you want to make a field size bigger, Okay, well, as I said, you, this is a smaller field size with smaller the, your target, the PTV. But if you make it bigger to cover your PTV, then actually your dose distribution is worse. Okay, so that means for the VMAT, your field size does not have to be covering the PTVs because of the rotational uh, nature. And uh, the results could be better in many cases then what do you use in the larger field size? And this is how this is uh, rotates. Let me see whether they can do it together. And uh, this is kind of field size you see uh, from the rapid arc. So this is the kind of the things you, you can see. The field size is not that you can do really small. And this is the study we did is if the field size reaches to a certain level, if you keep increasing regardless of what the PTV, this is, uh, you know, PTV hotspots, this, and this is you know, not quite the same. And it, it's, it's, the difference is with the larger field size is not really improving too much, even with the collimator rotations and uh, you have. So this is some, some of the criteria we use to select a field uh, size for this kind of uh, uh, pelvic treatment. And this is the head and neck cases. And typically we do two arcs with not uh, blocking anything. Okay, so this is what we do because the beam automatic will optimize, uh, give a less dose to the shoulders. And this is the results, the comparison between MRT and uh, VMAT. So our physician actually is very cri- critical. And they look at the DV each cuts and look at the different levels of the dose distribution and they look at the DVHs. If, if VMAT cannot or less accurate or less favorable in terms of organ sparing and the PTV coverage, they probably will not let us use the VMAT. So this is a case for head and neck. You know, this is the MRT, uh, this is MRT and this is VMAT. And the, the overall results is very similar. For some head and neck case, we're never able to get that close. So they did still using the MRTs, not using the VMAT. But the uh, majority, you can, uh, the, at least the 50%, you can do that. The problem is that, you know, the, the head and neck VMAT planning take a, quite a long time to reach the level. So to us, 
our our baseline or the gold standard is MRT. All the VMAT plan is a plan is a, a, compared against MRT. If it's worse than that, we're not using it. If we're better than that, we're using VMAT. So for the planning purposes, in most cases we have two plans, MRT and the VMAT, which is a lot of work for the physicists. And that's why we said that the VMAT is actually substantial increase the physics efforts. Uh, also the treatment plan or whatever it, who is doing that uh, in, in addition to the QA components. And this is the, how the, uh, the, the VMAT results, you know, how the, the shape changes for the head and neck at the different uh, uh, angles. And this is a uh, one rotations. Okay. Okay, the final rate, the quality assurances. Um, the quality assurances basically for VMAT is very similar to the S, uh, static entry MRTs in principle, but with a different measurement approaches due to its dynamic net natures because uh, the MLC is moving during the arc and the gantry is rotating, speed is changing, and uh, it moves when the dose rate also changes. The QA programs basically to validate the functionality and uh, performance of the accepted features. Now that's what basically. Went. So for each planned delivery, we did a patient-specific QA and a machine-specific QA. Now a lot of machine-specific QA has been discussed uh, in the previous presentation and my early presentation. So I will be uh, more focused on the patient-specific QAs. Uh, the machine care uh, QA part, and basically we have been talked about to test the accuracy MLC leave and the ability of system to accurately uh, verify uh, varying the dose rate and the gantry speed during the VMAT delivery, as well as the ability of the system to accurately vary the MLC leave speed during a VMAT delivery. The tolerance, we accept the baselines which we established based on our experiences. So machine QAs basically separated the daily and the monthly. Daily is basically is very similar to what we have been doing. Now there is uh, uh, discussions about whether should we include in rotational delivery of those to an unchamber phantom uh, for this. And this one is uh, still uh, in uh, discussions. But the monthly, we in implemented a substantial component as the VMAT task group uh, discussed that. Now, the patient-specific QAs. Now, uh, we have a, a physicist, uh, Dr. O'Daniels. He, she has uh, put a lot of efforts on to summarize the patient-specific QA protocols as well as the uh, documented and uh, did a lot of work and uh, has a paper just uh, published in the Red Journal about uh, what the QA technique is, uh, how accurate it is, as well as the efficient, efficiency and accuracies. So here I'm going to uh, just uh, summarize some of the work we have been doing at the Dukes and uh, which may not be the quite uh, uh, complete as other people will be doing. But the principle is that this is something uh, we need to uh, look into that. So one is the hybrid the QA techniques. Basically, this is we do the same thing as we have to map the plant to the phantom, and then we do the dose measure to the phantom, assume there's a phantom dose. Uh, if the good phantom dose will translate to the good patient dose. Rotational natures, not to uh, a single plant, and we, we look at the different planes, and the phantoms and the instruments, and the, for the instruments, we're using a on-chamber measurement, and so right now we're using the 2D arrays, and we're going to uh, invest, uh, get acquired uh, 3D uh, dosimeters, and to look at the comparisons between 2D and the 3D uh, dosimeters. And the data analysis, and we are analyzing the multiplanes, actual clonal sagittal views, and we look at the profile, point dose, as well as the gamma analysis. And the crushing check, that's also say patient specific QA because it's a low taste. Before patient on the table and uh, we also before the patient 
on the table. So there's a two levels to check. This is mainly to be verified by either by planner or the therapist, and this will be done all by the therapist to that. And this is our the QA device, and the way uh, it's, it's because this QA is a rather comp- complex, so we do multiplying, and also we do, uh, I'm sure, uh, because at this time, there's, uh, we don't have any uh, independent mind unit uh, calibration, uh, calculation algorithm to uh, perform this. So the current MRT technique uh, uh, and the way using the portal dosimetry. For the rapid arc, uh, we're using the ion chamber film and the uh, matrices and the 2D uh, dosimetry arrays. So the ion chamber, we measure the absolute dose. We accept uh, up to 3% deviations uh, compared to the calculated to the measured dose. And uh, we initially, we do the films at the coronal, sagittal, and axial planes. That was the uh, original, the first uh, 10, 20 cases. And uh, right now, it's uh, become uh, optional. And we always do the use, uh, using electronic film and the matrix to measure the coronal and the sagittal, sagittal uh, planes for this event. And for the, typically, this takes three to six hours per patient. Now, that's quite a long at this time. So we're going to see how this we can reduce. And the ion chambers, this is a measurement, and this is the film uh, measurement to compare, comparison result. And this is the setup for the ion chambers. We're using the 0.1 cc or 0.01 cc ion chambers for this uh, measurement. So all this will be CT scanned and it will be mapped to the for ion chamber measurement. And the calibrations, uh, this will be a 10 by 10 field as usual. And uh, for the rapid arc delivery, this is uh, what the, uh, we did set the center and uh, compare the eclipse. And we did the 39 V plan data for, bef- while for the public should data. And this is how we do the film. We basically using the matrix, put the film uh, in the middle, send it to the, uh, like this. And uh, we're using the Kodak uh, EDR2 film and uh, using the OmniPro MRT for the da- data analysis. This is the calibration uh, we did. And also we did the wrap uh, delivery using the multi-cube and the all three planes, and uh, compare with the Eclipse uh, planning system data gamma analysis. And this is uh, the, in the published data, we included the eight uh, VMAT plans. And this is uh, the results we get, and uh, typically the range is the 1.7 medium and the range from 2.8. And for the film, uh, we got the pass rate, uh, the 24 20, Cases all past 93 within beta analysis and uh, gamma analysis, and then if you go down to uh, 20, 97% is only 20 patients. So it's a uh, pass rate is relative. So our current cutoff is uh, 90% we use, and this is the data published and the plus. Um, you can see the ion chamber versus eclipse, and this is the the. The red one is the sagittal view and the coronal views, and the different views, and they can give, give you and the different the data, and the, some are probably the random arrows. And this is the eclipse data, and the, that's the film data from the uh, what we took, and the results is uh, is a quite uh, good in the majority case, and then the, in the axial view, there's a slightly difference here. But look at this is a 3% 3 millimeter, and we're using the 5% threshold when you said. But if you change the threshold uh, to 40%, and all the, the, the base uh, background noise will be eliminated. And this is, uh, I, we consider this is more close to the true uh, results, which we should get. And so the film is kind of gold standard we compare with the ion chamber, how good it is, uh, the chamber arrays especially. And this is the matrix uh, detectors, and everybody knows how this w- works. And it has a 0.07 uh, cubic sensitive volumes, and it's a 0.4 uh, cm uh, diameter here, and uh, 24 by 24 cm size. And uh, this is the spacing is 77.6 millimeter, which is uh, 
uh, rather big, you know, if you do radial surgery field, it's going to be a challenge. So if your field size is smaller, we're using the film, not using this. And this is automatic temperature uh, correction uh, algorithm. Now, one thing I want to alert everybody, and I think most of people probably aware of that, is that the angular dependence of this two-plane uh, devices. And when you move to the 90 degree around, or 270 uh, degrees, uh, for different energies, and it could have a, a quite a, a dosimetric differences, which this is the data we have. And therefore, uh, you have to be very careful. Now, this kind of average when you do a single arc, a full arc. This was the first notice that we have when we do partial arc, and the majority is goes through here, and we see a big difference, and we start to look into what the problem is. Now, right now, they have some kind of way to correct it, with angles, but it's uh, not easy to do it uh, good ways. So I think we should have looked into the 3D uh, dosimetries and uh, for the special the initiatives. And this is the matrix secure data. You know, overall the results actually is fairly uh, consistent and uh, in- impressive in general if uh, you're not consider uh, the partial arc. And this is the spread uh, plus uh, with our the patient reported in the red journal um, with use a matrix, coronal view, and the set of views. And you see they all spread it out and uh, about the 90% accepting rate. And uh, this is the what we see, and that's the, our threshold when we're using the 3%, 3 millimeter. And uh, and this is uh, certainly is better than what the uh, uh, what the we rep- uh, recommended in the report, but this is, uh, you know, it's only one millimeter. It was four uh, percent for millimeter, but that's the criteria we use here. And uh, you can decide what you want to use for each institutions. And and this is the ion chamber data versus the eclipse, and the ion chamber array data versus uh, eclipse data. And this is the ion chamber for the green point, uh, the and the uh, purple color is the ion chamber array. And you see the results are quite com- comparable. So that means that, you know, this is specific detector array uh, is quite useful, you know, if you do the four arcs for this kind of verifications. And we have a brain case plus it, and we don't see anything will be quite is specifically different. And I will consider they are uh, very uh, uniform with different sides. And this is a film versus ion chamber arrays. And uh, look at the different views. It looks like the, the, in the chrono view, the film is a little bit uh, lower uh, compared to this. You know, some could be related to the calibration, and some could relate to the, the background noises. But I think this is all within the, our acceptable ranges. And the film is uh, relatively lower because uh, the background is, and this using the 5% corrections. The other things we look at are the effectiveness and the versus efficient. You know, we all claim the rapid R can help us do things much quicker. But is it really faster? Or how to define the faster and how to look at these issues? So we, we, we give the stage one, we do very intensive QA. We do ion chamber, we do film, and we do ion chamber array, all in the two planes and the 3D uh, Gel dosimetries, all this, they can do the. This is what we should look at at the very beginning. At least you should do the 10 cases with all this kind of case. And then the stage two, you can be a little, a little bit relaxed with your rigorous QAs. And you can do ion chamber, ion chamber array in two planes. This is what we're doing now. After we've done all this with 10, 20 cases, and then we move back to this case. And we think if this data shows well, it's almost matches correlate to the good results with all this measurement. And the, the stage three is effectiveness and the efficient QAs. So ion chamber, ion chamber array in one plane and the ion chamber array only. I think this is the, you know, something you, you can judge yourself. And this is what we're doing now. Now whether we're moving to the stage, we don't know yet. But I think this is the direction uh, you can look at. Now, to, to do a comparison, so the time you spend, which is, you know, Jennifer put a, uh, a lot of efforts to calculate this time, um, 
typically the iron chamber measurement, the first one you probably take 15 minutes. Okay, the unit is minute. And then when you do the second one, iron chamber, that probably, uh, you know, will be a much less, okay, deliveries. But preparation is still the same because you have to do the same thing. And the films and the time can be also delayed. So with all these three levels, QAs, you can start from 15, one hour down to the potentially 10 minutes. But this is the 15 minutes that you, for each, uh, arc that you need to test spin. So the, how you do QA, you need to decide what you see for the patient's safety of it. But this is the time uh, level. The ratio probably will more reflect what you're going to see. The, each interview depends on how quickly you can do the other part of work. And also when implementing a new technologies, uh, we think the performing intensive patient-specific QA for the first group of patients you know, 10 to 30 patients, that would be ideal. And rely on the QA, the gold stand. And the 3D QA, very useful. Actually, we start to look at the 3D QA stuff and for small field, and it's uh, it's very uh, instructive and uh, enlightening to see how accurate 2D and 1D measurement could be. And using a gold stand QA technology to transit uh, to the newer QA devices. And uh, we have current QA device. If you use any new different QA device, you should be able to correlate the current technology, current results to the new technology. And uh, the goal is to tr- uh, achieve the effective, QA is effective. So in conclusion, the rapid arc is uh, one format of rotational MRT uh, for those uh, paintings. The implementation of rapid arc or the VMAT requires careful planning, testing, and the verifications. The thorough testing and the commissionings are necessary prior to a patient treatment. QA is a critical step, always compared with the static field MRT plan in the early phases. Until you know what the MRT plan can get and what you to judge it to the rapid arc, these two plans should be always done and for the comparisons. Otherwise, rapid arc is, is, could be a downgrading, uh, your image, uh, planning qualities. The rapid arc should be, uh, judged by its accuracy, safety, efficient, applicability, integration, and adaptations, uh, for your treatment uh, facilities. Thank you. Dr. Gavin, and uh, maybe we also can invite our co authors Dr. Wu and Dr. Ying, uh, show uh, come up if anybody have any questions. Dr. Wu, you want to come here? Yeah. Been very thorough talk on how to implement RapidArc, but I have one question. I noticed that even in your final stage, now that you're confident with your system, you're still doing an ion chamber measurement plus an ion chamber array. Am I missing something? Can you not calibrate your ion chamber array for absolute dose? And- Eliminate the ion chamber? Well, the, 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 the issue is raised to us is the ion chamber array is have angular dependencies. And each ion chamber, there are so many ion chamber, micro chambers inside, and you, you really don't have a good controls. But for the array measure, mainly we look at the plane distributions. And the ion chamber is to do the second verify the point those, make sure the ion chamber is appropriate. Yes, that's we have. Have you, have you seen any evidence of that that angular dependence in your measurements? Yes. Uh, absolute dose. Yes. Okay. Dr. Galvin, I thought you made an amazing statement. Then that uh, while everyone's running, you know, chasing after the VMAT uh, model that we really haven't necessarily looked at just what we now have and how efficiently we can deliver IMRT. Like we, at our institution, we have Pinnacle and we use wide field DMPO. We have a variant 21EX. We use step and shoot at 600 MUs per minute. And we can treat a nine field head and neck in six minutes from first beam on to last beam off. And if you're talking about doing two VMAT arcs for head and neck, what's the delivery time? Three to four minutes from first beam on? So you're saving two minutes. And so for us to implement that, though, we'd have to pay $250,000 for a software key. So I think each center needs to look at how they're now delivering um, 
static beam IMRT and see if they can uh, you know, make it more efficient and maybe not just you know, run after VMAT because everybody else is. So I, I appreciate your remark. But can, can I ask you a question? When you say you can deliver six minutes, how many beams you use for this headache? Yeah, that would be nine beams. Nine um, beams. But with wide field DMPO, you don't have to split it. I understand with Eclipse users, they have to split fields if they exceed whatever it is, 14 and a half. And that takes a lot of time. But if you can avoid that, and if you could minimize, uh, you know, we set a minimum segment area of seven square centimeters, a minimum MU of four. So if you craft your, your IMRT beams correctly, you don't have to spend 15 minutes of beam time for a head in that case. I think if you can deliver six minutes, I will not, you know, try to do the two arc, rapid arc. But you certainly should look at the plan qualities, you know, to do a comparison. Yeah. No, that's a good statement. Hi, I just have a comment. Um, we uh, went around the angular dependence by uh, Sun Nuclear has an isocentric mounting fixture, which basically keeps the map check fixed to the gantry head, so that helped a lot. And I have another question. Um, your arc obviously goes from 181 to 179. Do you Did you guys have to model your couch, or you had a tennis racket couch, or the KV imaging couch from Varian? Uh, we have the exact couch. Uh, the culture the bearing system has. At this time, we basically ignore the culture the bar attenuations. Okay, thank you. But for the 60 tables, it's a uniform, so you just need to put a table in the treatment planning system that's included. Well, thank you, everybody.